very good morning to everyone well we welcome you all to this physics webinar stay home enjoy physics jointly organized by the indian association of physics teachers iapt rc7 gujarat essence tech and department of science and technology government of gujarat and gujarat council on science and technology good course we welcome you all to the lecture series 3 on how come newton's law work by professor pc deshmukh professor department of physics iit tirupati I now request Professor Dr. Dushar Pandya to please introduce our speaker. Well, good morning to all participants and respected physics educator. Uh, really, it gives me a great pleasure, and I'm indeed uh, honored to introduce uh, eminent Professor P. C. Deshmukh sir. As Harshan said, that Professor P. C. Deshmukh. Uh, was a professor of physics at Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, for the period of 32 years. Uh, very recently, uh, he has been assigned a mentoring responsibility at IIT Tirupati, and as a professor of physics and dean, uh, dean of the faculty. Uh, currently, he is adjunct faculty at Iser. My dear friend, Iser stands for Indian Institute of Science, Education, and Research. In addition to his full-time appointment of professor at IIT Tirupati, uh, dear friends, uh, during this 35 years, Professor Deshmukh established himself as an excellent teacher and pioneer researcher. His area of research is photoabsorption process in free. confined atoms molecules and ions he publishes about 130 research paper in various national and international journals dear friend he has visited many countries like denmark usa italy for the extension and collaboration for his research work uh, dear students uh, professor p c deshmukh has authored a uh, two books which have been published by springer and cambridge university press uh, dear friends his book on foundation of classical mechanics is very popular among the ug and pg students his forthcoming book is on quantum physics of atomic structure and dynamics more than 15 students have been awarded phd degree under his supervision uh, dear students he has delivered about 125 video lectures i would say the entire course on internet for national program on technology enhanced learning which is popularly known as nptel lectures which are organized by all iits and iic bangalore besides his engagement in all these academic activities Professor Deshmukh has also worked as an editor, chief editor, and referee in various reputed journal of physics. He was also a chief editor and convener of several national and international conferences and conference proceedings. Also, he has also worked as a president and secretary uh, of Indian Society of Atomic and Molecular Physics. dear friend there is a very long list of his administrative service and additional academic services really we are fortunate that professor p c deshmukh sir is present with us online with this brief introduction i would like to request professor p c deshmukh sir for his presentation on how come newton's law works sir over to you thank you very much thank you toshar and uh, greetings and good morning to everybody who is uh, now connected on this video conference i'm really grateful to the indian association of physics teachers the sn tech the gujarat council of science and technology in particular to uh, harshal sangvi uh, chintan panchasar and professor toshar pandya for the initiative uh, have taken which gives me a great opportunity to connect to all of you uh, right now i am 
now in Bangalore from Tirupati. I'm moving to Bangalore. So thank you very much, uh, Tushar, for all the generous introduction. Thank you, sir. Let me get straight into the topic here. And I will begin with this question here. And uh, are you able to see this at the top? Yes. Correct. The first point I would like to make is that there are not two sets of laws, two sets of laws of nature, one for large objects and one for tiny objects. Because very often we say that, okay, Classical physics is used for macroscopic, larger sized objects and quantum mechanics for tiny and small objects. Now, there certainly are not two sets of laws. There is only one set of law and that is what we are looking for. So we want to know what just is the law of nature. And here we have a problem that if we consider Newton's laws to represent classical physics, and of course there are equivalent formulations due to Lagrange and Hamilton and so on, but Newton's equations, they require, it's a second order differential equation. So when you integrate the equation, you will have two constants of integration, which you must plug in. And these two constants of integration would be the initial position and the initial momentum. And how do you get this information about position and momentum? Because if you try to make a measurement of one, you lose information about the other. And this is not due to the uncertainty principle. It is the uncertainty principle which is due to this. When you make an attempt to measure position, you lose information about the momentum. And when you make an attempt to measure momentum, you lose information about the position. And the uncertainty principle is a very nice way of putting this information in a compact and quantitative manner, but then you have to define various operators and so on for that. So I will get to that point a little bit later. But now we see the conflict between Newton's laws and the laws of nature. Newton's laws require the position and momentum, and these are not simultaneously available. Yet, the Newton's laws seem to work in a large number of situations. So, so what we are going to discuss this morning is how come Newton's laws work? And to extract the answer from the laws of nature, from the laws of physics, we are going to go through the work of Galileo, Newton, Lagrange, Hamilton, and a good bit of my talk will be about Feynman's contribution to our understanding of this question. So Newton's laws, of course, everybody knows, and you can, uh, like Shankar Mahadevan's breathless, you can uh, recite all the three laws in one breath. So what are these laws? Let us visit them very briefly. The first law is how my wife describes my perpetual state. <laughs> and there is, this is the first expression of the first law. And there is an alternative expression that a body at constant momentum continues to be so at a constant velocity. Now this is not an easy thing to discover. Because when you look at the speedometer in the car and you maintain it at 100 kilometers per hour, certainly you get a traffic ticket. But more than that, you are overcoming the friction by the power which is generated by the car's engine. And this was not an easy law to discover that a body remain and mind you i'm always referring to the value of the momentum the momentum being zero or the momentum being constant and this was discovered by galileo by performing some experiments um, galileo was a great experimentalist father of experimental physics as we all regard him as and for example if you drop an object from the mast 
top of a ship, then it is going to fall at the bottom, regardless of the ship being anchored at the shore, or if it's moving at a constant momentum, at a constant velocity in the sea. And this is how Galileo discovered the law of inertia. Now, this is incorporated in the Newtonian scheme as the first law, but this is actually due to Galileo. And it is called as Newton's law because Newton incorporated in his scheme of dynamics. And that explains to us why momentum changes. When momentum changes, the harder you hit, the harder you are hurt. So the momentum changes at a rate, which is dp by dt, which is actually equal to the force, which is applied on it. So I do not write the second law as f equal to ma. I write it rather as dp by dt, because what is central to the first and second law is the momentum. Constancy of momentum is the law of inertia. When it changes, it does so at a rate which is equal to the force, which is the second law. Now it turns out that momentum being mass times velocity, you can see that it becomes mass times acceleration. All right, Ma uh, the, the force becomes mass times acceleration. And you can then recognize acceleration as the effect of force and force as the cause of acceleration. So now what happens is this is a linear relationship between the cause and the effect. And you can interpret the second law as the principle of causality and determinism. It is a linear stimulus response formalism. And this becomes the basis of Newtonian dynamics. And then of course, there is the third law, which is basically a statement of conservation of momentum. All right, so the statement of conservation of linear momentum, that linear momentum of an isolated system is conserved, is the essential content of the third law expressed often as action and reaction being equal and opposite. But this is actually at a more fundamental level, it is coming from the deep connection between symmetry and conservation laws. So whenever you have a homogeneous space and there is translational invariance in the medium, then you are automatically led to the conservation of momentum. This is a very simple illustration of an extremely brilliant theorem named after Emmy Noether that associated with every symmetry, there is a conservation law and vice versa. So the conservation of linear momentum is just an expression of the Noether's theorem for homogeneous, homogeneous space. So these are the three laws of Newton, and they are all dependent on an underlying idea that the mechanical state of a system is represented by a point in the phase space. So you can have a position velocity phase space, and then you represent the mechanical state of a point in the phase space. And when you take when you study its evolution, temporal evolution, how does it evolve with time, all right? So dq by dt, dv by dt, when you examine these things, then dv by dt gives you the acceleration, which is the effect of the force, and it is directly proportional to the force in the linear similar response theory. Notice that the evolution with time enables us to predict where the object will be in the future. You're talking about evolution in time. So this is what mechanics is about. You're asking, how does the system evolve with time? But you can also ask, what was its state in the past? So if you consider the earth going around the sun, you can not only predict where the earth will be tomorrow, you can also determine where it was 10 hours ago in the past or 10 hours or 10 years or 10 million years ago, right? So you can, you are able to get this information both for the future and for the past. And it is because of the fact that the equation of motion is symmetric under time reversal. As time goes forward or backward, 
and this is because you have a second time derivative involved in the Newton's equation of motion. So d by dt, when the time is reversed, becomes changes its sign, but it happens twice. And because it happens twice, the minus one into minus one ends up giving you a plus one, and the laws of Newton are symmetric under time reversal. So now you can represent the state of the system by position and velocity, a point in the phase space, but you can also represent it by a well-defined function of position and velocity. And this function is what I have expressed by the letter L. So L is a function of position and velocity. Equivalently, you can represent the state of the system by position and momentum or by a function of position and momentum. And the function I have used is H, which is the function of position and momentum. You all would anticipate it to be the Hamiltonian and L being the Lagrangian, okay? And how does the state evolve with time is given by F equal to dP by dt in Newtonian mechanics or by this equation which tells you del L by del Q equal to d by dt of del L by del Q dot, which is the Lagrange's equation of motion, or you can write it equivalently in terms of Hamiltonian mechanics by representing the state of the system by the Hamiltonian and then determining at what rate does Q change which is q dot and at what rate does p change which is p dot so now you have two first order differential equations but then there is a sign uh, the sign of the right hand side is plus in the first and minus in the second and that takes care of the time reversal symmetry so the time reversal symmetry is a common feature of all the equations of motion which are classical expressions of the laws so the basis for getting the Lagrange's equations or the Hamilton's equations is this ansatz. It is like a, a hypothesis, if you might call it. And the ansatz is that given the fact that the state of the system is represented by the Lagrangian, then the solution to the mechanical problem is that the trajectory is described, trajectory of the object, its temporal evolution and how the state of the system evolves with time is determined by the equation of motion, which is either the Lagrange's equation or the Hamilton's equation. And how do you obtain these equations of motion? Th these equations are obtained from an ansatz. That action is stationary. Action is this integral of the Lagrangian over time from an initial time, start time to the end time, from T1 to T2. And if this is a stationary, if this is extremum, then of course, action is an extremum. And this condition automatically leads you to the Lagrange's equations or the Hamilton's equations. So the Lagrange's equation is actually the necessary and sufficient condition that, and that action is an extremum. So the Lagrangian, which is expressed as a function of position and velocity, so Q is the position, the time derivative is what I represent by a dot on putting on, on Q. So Q and Q dot are the position and velocity. And the simplest expression for this function is to write it as a sum of two functions. One, a function of velocity alone, Q dot square, velocity being the square of um, uh, the, the reason to take the square of velocity is that the square will be independent of the direction and you don't expect the Lagrangian to depend on directions. So the square takes care of it and then it would depend on the position itself. So you expect it to be a function of position here, which is F2 Q and a function of velocity, but I prefer to take it as a function of the square of the velocity to make sure that it does not depend on the direction of the velocity in isotopic space. So what is the simplest function of this type you can construct? You can construct L to be given by T minus V because T is the kinetic energy, which is half mv square, and you can subtract the potential energy. Why do you not add it? 
If you add it, you would get the total energy, but when you subtract, you get what is called as a Lagrangian. And here is the key to this. The choice of the minus sign is governed by the fact that when you put this expression for the Lagrangian as T minus V in this ANSATS and then demand that this action is stationary, it is, it is an extremum, you get Lagrange's equation, which is this. This is a necessary and sufficient condition. The algebra is straightforward. You can work it out by applying the variational principle. I will not go into those details. I want to restrict my discussion to physical principles rather than to mathematical algebra, which a high school student or a college student can easily do. So this Lagrange's equation, as you can see, is completely equivalent to Newton's equation of motion, which is F equal to dP by dt. So if you see, I have segmented th this equations in three blocks. The two blue blocks at the far end, the left end and the right end, represent the Lagrange's equation. And the central block represents the Newton's equation. And you see that this particular choice of the Lagrangian as t minus v gives you complete equivalence with Newton's equation of motion, which is a happy thing because it would be terrible if you get a diff, if you, if Newton's equation and Lagrange's equation were not even compatible, but sure enough, they are compatible. They are completely equivalent as you can see from this family of equations here, the two equations. And the nice thing about it is that you can extract these uh, equation of motion from the basic ansatz that action is stationary. So this becomes a fundamental consideration to extract the equation of motion for classical mechanics. So now we have got two formulations which we have just discovered are completely equivalent. What is the stimulus response basis? which is based on the principle of causality and determinism. This is the Newtonian dynamics. The second is the variational principle that action is an extremum. And this is the alternative formulation of classical mechanics. Both of these are equivalent. So at some level, you can make a guess that yes, Newton's law works because it is certainly compatible with the principle of variation that action is stationary. So this is part of the answer that we are looking for. However, notice that the idea of force is not used anywhere in the principle of action, principle of least action or extremum action in the Lagrangian or Hamiltonian formulation. Force, the idea of force is not used anywhere. And the variational principle is not used anywhere in Newtonian dynamics. So these two are completely independent but equivalent formulation. And the question that we are really answering is what are the laws of nature and how do they describe nature's characteristics? This is, these are the questions that we are answering. We are not even attempting to answer why are the laws of nature what they are. We are trying to describe what are the laws of nature. And this is a big fundamental point that I would like to emphasize over here, that most questions in physics reduce to what and how and not why. So there are these two alternative formulations which describe what the laws of nature are and how do they describe the evolution of a mechanical system and how do they explain the trajectories of objects in phase space. Now, this is nice and the principle of variation can be illustrated by this very nice question which was posed. The question was find the brachistoke crone for an object which would go from the point S, which is at a higher height, to a lower, high, to a lower point F. Suppose you've got an object like a marble or a piece of stone or anything and you drop it, but it doesn't fall vertically down because it is constrained to move on some sort of a surface. It can also be a bead 
which is riding on a wire which has got different shapes. So either a bead which is riding on different wires or a piece of marble which is rolling down a curved surface. So that is the picture that we have in mind. And the question is, what kind of surface would, be, would give you the least time for the object to reach the lower point, the final point F, where if you released it from the initial point, which is the start point S. So the least time trajectory is what is called as a brachistochrome. All right. So this was the question which was posed by Johann Bernoulli. And it was a challenge question. And what he said is that if somebody communicates to me the solution of the proposed problem, I shall publicly declare him worthy of praise. So that was how hard a problem it was. And in those days, it was common for mathematicians and physicists to pose such challenge questions to each other and make an attempt to answer them. And there were five different answers which Bernoulli got, including one answer that he had for himself. And one of the answers was provided anonymously, but Bernoulli could recognize that this answer would have come from Isaac Newton. He went on to say that we know the lion by his claw. So you can actually fabricate such a brachistochrome in your workshop without much effort. And I would like to demonstrate, uh, I would like to show this construction fabrication of a brachistochrome. So there are four different shapes which are fabricated via between point A and B. Only one is a brachistochrome. The others are not the brachistochromes. And you can just drop an object from point A and time it using a photodiode and then measure the time it takes to reach the point B by clocking it using another photodiode. It's a very simple experiment that you can set up in your school or college laboratory. This was fabricated by three of my students at uh, Aisar Tirupati, um, Parth, uh, Abhiya, and Vaishak. And uh, I have also described it in the book, which uh, Professor Pandya mentioned, um, the foundations of classical mechanics. So there is a more detailed description of this in my book, which you're welcome to read up. Now, here, this entire scheme of Newtonian mechanics or Lagrangian mechanics or Hamiltonian mechanics is now governed by the fact that you must have the position and momentum known simultaneously and accurately. So now what happens is that if you measure a position, you certainly get an answer. Now you measure the momentum, you get an answer. You measure the position again, you measure the momentum again, and you measure them repeatedly in different orders. Q, P, 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 Q, Q, P, P. However, it doesn't matter. You, if you keep measuring this again and again and again and again, every time you get an answer, you will get an accurate answer, but it is not going to be the same as you had on the previous measurement, which means that you simply cannot trust it. This is because the measurement of position and measurement of momentum, these are not compatible measurements. And you just cannot get simultaneous information of position and momentum. And this is really very unnerving because the entire scheme of Newtonian dynamics or Lagrangian or Hamiltonian dynamics is based on the fact that you require the position and momentum and this information is simply not available to you at this point. So now obviously the question that asks itself is how come Newton's laws work? When you make an attempt to reconcile with the fact that position and momentum are not simultaneously measurable, you cannot get this information, yet you need them to solve Newton's equation or Lagrange's or Hamilton's equation, you are confronted by a serious question that this information is not available to you. You must abandon the description of the state of a system by its position and momentum in a, uh, by a point in the phase space. You need a completely new framework for developing physics. This is really unnerving. And we know 
how physics has responded to this. Physics responded to this by inventing quantum laws. That you do not represent the state of a system by a point in the phase space. Instead, you represent it by a state vector. Where is this vector? It is in the Hilbert space. What is its coordinate representation? The coordinate representation of the state vector is the wave function. And how does this state evolve with time? The evolution of the wave function is described by del psi by del t. And when you express this time evolution, you have the Schrodinger equation in front of you. Okay? So the answer has to come from quantum physics and it has to come from completely new ideas which are uh, which take you away from this description of the state of a system by position and momentum and it immediately places you in the Hilbert space, its coordinate representation, whether you have the de Broglie Schrodinger formalism or the Heisenberg Born Jordan formalism and so on. Now, quantum mechanics, of course, had a very challenging development. And the challenge came from brilliant minds because quantum mechanics is intrinsically statistical. When you think of statistics, you think of the game of dice. And laws of classical mechanics are also statistical at some level, like Maxwell's distribution. We are familiar that one uses statistics, but only when you're dealing with a large number of particles and it becomes impossible to keep track of individual particles. Then you develop the kinetic theory of gases, for example, and develop average properties. So instead of looking at the position and momentum of every single particle, you look at the average kinetic energy and then de develop ideas like temperature and so on. So that is how statistics enters classical mechanics. In quantum mechanics, statistics enters not just when you have a large number of particles, but even when you have a single particle, not only when you have a single particle, even if you were to describe a vacuum state, you need quantum theory and you need a statistical interpretation of quantum mechanics. So this was very troublesome. And Einstein challenged this idea by, he's famously quoted that God does not play dice. And there are these famous debates between Einstein and Niels Bohr in 1927 Solvay conference. And Bohr always won the argument against Einstein. What he was able to point out were some inconsistencies in Einstein's arguments and establish the fact that entanglement statistics is intrinsic to the laws of nature. And it was not easy to test it because how do you know that the probabilistic laws of classical mechanics are different from the probabilistic laws of quantum mechanics? So this distinction had to be established and it took a long time to figure out how this can be established because physicists were busy using quantum laws. They came up with understanding of atomic spectroscopy, and then condensed matter, nuclear physics, nuclear potentials, and so on. And it took more than 30 years after quantum mechanics. In 1964, John Bell was able to come up with some mathematical statement, which was able to provide a test that the description of statistics, the description of probability in quantum mechanics is different from the way it is in classical mechanics and entanglement is actually intrinsic to the laws of nature. So now we know that there is no exception to quantum laws. Laws of nature are essentially quantum mechanical. No exception has ever been found. And we now have to reconcile with our original question that we started out with, how come Newton's laws still work? Because they are still based on the idea that position and momentum are known, how they change in time provides us with the solution to the mechanical problem. And 
we now look at the formulation of quantum mechanics. And there are these two famous alternative formulations of quantum theory. One is the de Broglie Schrodinger formalism, um, which is based on the wave function and the Schrodinger equation. Second is based on the Heisenberg formulation of the principle of uncertainty. But then there is also a third formulation, which is due to Richard Feynman. And the rest of our discussion today is going to appeal to Feynman's formulation to get the answer to our question as to how come Newton's laws really work. So the third formulation is due to Richard Feynman. So there are these three formulations. One is the cat being dead or alive formulation, the principle of superposition and the de Broglie um, Schrodinger formalism, the Schrodinger equation formalism. The second is the Heisenberg formulation that a dog does not bark and bite at the same time. And the third is the path integral approach to quantum mechanics, which is what we are going to discuss now. So the introduction to the path integral approach, uh, let us see how Feynman himself was led to that. And this happened when he was in a high school. And this is really very interesting because that is how soon uh, these brilliant people start making important contributions and um, you know, consider challenging questions. His teacher, high school teacher, Mr. Bader, he looked at Feynman and he said that, okay, you look bored, so let me tell you something that is interesting. And what Mr. Bader introduced to this high school kid was the principle of least action, which we just went through. So this is what eventually led to the path integral approach to quantum mechanics. And this was actually prompted, uh, Feynman himself was led to that also by a suggestion, which at that time seemed to be somewhat mysterious because it was uh, very brief. It was made by Dirac and this formulation explains very nicely how classical mechanics, whether Lagrange's equations, Hamilton's equations, or Newton's equations, they tell us how the Newton's equations work, how the Hamilton's equations work, because they tell you a very straightforward, direct way of backward integration of classical mechanics into quantum mechanics. So let us look at this question here, that if you, throw a piece of stone from this start point here. And eventually this throne will take a certain trajectory and fall at a later time over here. And the question is, what is the trajectory of this stone? And we all know that you can draw infinite trajectories, but only one is correct, which is this blue trajectory, the parabolic trajectory that you see in this figure. Every other solution is wrong. And how do you get this? You get it, you can get it by solving Newton's equation of motion, right? The force is known, which is gravity, all right? The second order differential equation is known, which is Newton's law, okay? What do you need? Two initial conditions, the initial position and the initial momentum or the initial velocity. And you can get the solution as this trajectory. It's a matter of high school algebra. Now, let us ask the same question, but let us demand that instead of using two initial conditions, use one initial condition and one final condition. We give you the initial position at time t1 and we give you the final position at time t2. And now solve this problem. How would you do it? Then the most straightforward way of doing it is to apply the principle of extremum action. Action is this integral, okay? So this is the power of the variational principle, okay? You, you develop action, this integral of the Lagrangian, and then you demand that this integral must be, um, must be an extremum, it must be stationary, and then you will find that the necessary and sufficient condition that action would be stationary is that the 
stone wood traverse along that blue trajectory, which is the parabolic trajectory. So that's the necessary and sufficient condition that you will get from this. So this becomes an integral part of Feynman's formulation of quantum mechanics. And this is called as the space-time formulation, space-time approach to non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Feynman was a postdoc at the time, and um, this paper came out in the Reviews of Modern Physics in 1948. The method is called as the path integral approach to quantum mechanics. And let me briefly narrate what this part is. So the, the best illustration of quantum mechanics is, of course, the Young's double slit experiment. In fact, in one of his celebrated lectures on uh, which most of you would have seen on the YouTube, Feynman says that almost everything that is there in quantum mechanics can be explained with reference to the Young's double slit experiment with light and electron bullets. So here is the Young's double slit experiment. You have got a screen on which the bullets would be registered. You have got another screen. You make two holes in it and fire either light or electron bullets or any particles. And the particles would go from either one slit or the other, all right? So you have one possible trajectory. You have another possible trajectory. And the intensity that you would get on the screen will not come from the sum of the intensities of the two beams, but by squaring the sum of the amplitudes of the two beams, okay? So it is the amplitudes which interfere and the amplitudes are also accompanied by phase. So which is why the quantum mechanical wave function is uh, complex, there is a real part and an imaginary part, there is a phase which you can write as e to the i theta, all right, theta being the phase which is cosine theta plus i sine theta. And this phase is what determines whether you will have constructive interference or destructive interference. So this is the usual description of the Young's double slit experiment. So now you, what you do is go ahead and make a third hole in the screen. Right? And now you have alternative paths. And these are the alternative paths that Feynman requires you to consider in his formulation of quantum mechanics. So you have alternative paths. You can have number of alternative paths and the probability amplitude that a particle which was initially at x0 at time t0 would be at another point x prime at t prime would be given by the sum of all of these alternative paths. You must sum over all alternative histories, whether the particle may have come from slit one or two or three or whatever. And there is an amplitude part and a phase part, which is given by e to the i theta. And the e to the i theta, this sum is what is represented on the right, right hand side of this equation as an integral, okay? And the phase is given by action, okay? The integral t0 to t prime dtl uh, is nothing but the Lagrangian that we are familiar with from the principle of extremum action in Lagrangian and Hamiltonian mechanics. So this is Feynman's prescription. Now, natural question is why would it work? And I want to remind you that it is not why that we answer. We are answering what is the law of physics? What is it that explains to you the interference pattern? And the law is this that the amplitudes are given by this particular expression which Feynman proposed, and damn it, it works. So this is the law of physics, and this is what physics aims at explaining. What is the law of physics, and how does it explain na na natural phenomena? So actually, you can 
now have another screen in between. So you had one screen with two holes, now you had another screen with three holes, and now you consider all of these alternative paths. You have to sum over all these alternative histories. So you remember in the previous expression on the previous slide, I had an integral which was just the limit of a sum, and you're going to sum over all alternative trajectories. So you can have one trajectory like this, right? You can have another trajectory like this. You can have another one like what I show by these blue arrows. You may have some more alternatives. The blue arrow may again have alternative paths and all of these alternative paths must be summed over to construct the integral that we had on the previous slide. You may have some more alternatives, like this, the one shown by the green alternative sign. But this is really strange. And why this works is not the question we are going to answer. We are going to tell you how, what is it that works? What is the mathematical law that describes the law of nature? And Feynman tells you that this is the law and you test it and it works. So this is, these are the alternative paths that you consider. You must consider all of these and they all have got a phase element associated with those. And the phases are sometimes going to add up and sometimes they are not going to add up. Okay? When they add up, you will get constructive interference. When they do not, you will get destructive interference. And that is what is going to generate the interference pattern or the final outcome of your experiment. All right. So now consider some more parts. We put some more screens and we make more holes in it. We make one or two or more holes. We can put infinite slits and infinite holes. All right. And you can think of just about any alternative trajectory that either the light or the electron can take from the uh, source to the screen and it can take infinitely many different alternative paths and you must sum over all of these. All right, all of these paths have to be summed over and then you can construct the integration over these alternative paths. Consider some obstacles somewhere else in space and think of a path that shown by this green. So you get an obstruction on the second screen, it gets bounced from the red obstacle and then from the blue obstacle, and then goes back into the first hole of the first screen, all right? So now you're getting crooked paths, which you may not have imagined, but all of these paths are viable physical paths in the Penman's formulation you must consider all of these paths. What if it takes a path like this? Yes, anything, any path that is imaginable is to be considered. And many of these will end up in different phases and they might cancel each other, but they may not. And it is for you to sum over all as possible. This is also sometimes called as sum over all histories because how the particle came, did it follow the path red or the blue or the green is irrelevant. All the histories must be summed over. Okay. What if this red obstacle is an object on Mars? How much time would it take for light to reach from the source to the screen in your laboratory? on the desk. It takes more than eight minutes to reach Earth from the sun. How long would it take to go from the source up to the screen in your laboratory desk? And Feynman is asking you to consider an obstacle on Mars. How much time would it take to get there? What if the second bounce is from a different galaxy? Mars is at least in our own planetary system. What? If it is from an obstacle in another galaxy, M87, we just 
pictured the black hole of this galaxy quite recently. And all of these parts are viable parts and they must be summed over in the Feynman formulation of quantum mechanics. Okay, so some questions would come to your mind. These particles which are traveling from the source to the screen are what I call as Feynman particles. I do not call it as a classical corpuscular particle of Newtonian or Lagrangian mechanics, nor do I call it as a wave. And I'm not using the vocabulary of wave particle duality anymore. I'm using a terminology which is appropriate for what I'm going to refer to as Feynman particles in the path integral formulation of quantum mechanics. So these Feynman particles, these go from the source up to the screen and they can take infinitely many paths. And we don't even worry about what would be their speed. Okay, we don't even worry about what would be their speed. If we know the exact trajectory they have taken, we know the positions from which those particles have gone, then we are not going to ask what their momentum was. And this is best understood by quoting Niels Bohr, who made a very nice comment once that quantum mechanics does not answer all questions. It tells you what are the right questions to be asked. Okay, so the question before us is not what was the velocity or what was the momentum. The question is, what is it that explains the interference pattern? That's your fundamental question. Okay. The, your fundamental question is how do you account for how, all right, not why. How do you account for the interference pattern on your screen? What is the law of physics which explains this interference pattern? And this law is the Feynman law. This is Schrodinger law or the Heisenberg law. These are equivalent formulations. This is the law and this is the what which physics is answering. It doesn't tell you why does the speed, why can you not measure the speed? It tells you that, okay, your question is not why, uh, why you cannot measure the speed. The, your question is how do you explain the interference pattern? Don't lose track of your fundamental question. So it is the how and the what and not why. So, this is what you're trying to account for. And quantum mechanics now gives you a set of rules. These rules can be formulated either in the de Broglie Schrodinger formalism by developing the Schrodinger equation, or you can write it that position and momentum are no longer to be treated as dynamical variables. You treat them as operators which do not commute. You write the quantum uncertainty principle and develop an whole scheme of algebra that we call as quantum theory. And this quantum theory is what describes how nature behaves. What are the laws of nature? How do you describe a natural system? How does it evolve with time? It is now described by these fundamental laws of nature, whether it is the de Broglie Schrodinger formalism or the Heisenberg formalism or the Feynman formalism. It works. And it appears strange that mathematics works. And this is a beautiful comment, very important penetrating comment made by Eugene Wigner, that the miracle of appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. And Wigner said this in one of his articles, which, is, which was called as the unreasonable effect, effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences. So the relationship between mathematics and physics is extremely intimate. It's more than what one might describe it as saying that, okay, mathematics is the language of physics. It is fundamentally integrated into how you describe the laws of nature. And you describe it 
using a mathematical formulation. What is a mathematical formulation? It is F equal to dP by dt. Yes, it worked. It is H psi equal to IH cross del psi by del T. Yes, it works. It is that the operators for position and momentum do not commute. It works. And these are equivalent formulations of physics, but at different levels, at different levels of approximations. The classical way, the Newtonian way, or the Lagrangian or the Hamiltonian uh, formulation is also an expression of the same physical law, except that it is only an approximation. And how do you recognize that it is an approximation to the real laws of nature, which are not classic? The real laws of nature we have found are not quantum. It is not that there are there is a different set of laws for large objects and a different set of laws for small objects. The laws of nature are the same and they are essentially quantum mechanical. No exception is found to that. But the Feynman formulation will allow you to backward, it will allow you a backward integration of the variational principle which led you to the Lagrange and Hamilton's equation, which we have seen is completely equivalent to Newton's formulation. So when you look at these amplitudes, and the phases. You have the e to the i theta term coming in, all right? It has got a real part and an imaginary part. And these would come from different alternatives. And you can certainly represent a complex number on a two dimensional vector diagram, okay? And you can add up the two vectors using the triangle law of addition. All right, and this is how you carry out the addition of the amplitudes of vectors. And this is how the phases are going to add up. So when you add up the phases from all of these infinite paths that you consider, you allow the particle, the Feynman particle, to go from the source to the screen through either slit one or through slit two, or get bounced off the galaxy M87 or wherever, all right? All of these alternative paths will have different phases. And when you add up all of these paths vectorially, then you may get a sum total which is zero as you get when you add vectors, n number of vectors so that the head of the final arrow ends up at the tail of the first one. When that happens, the net displacement vector becomes zero, okay? On the other hand, if the addition is carried out in phase, that is shown by these blue lines, all right? Here, there is an in-phase addition and you get constructive interference. And here is the answer to our question. That Newton's laws work when non-classical paths add up to zero. The non-classical paths, whichever we recognize in today's language as classical physics and quantum physics, the non-classical paths, they also follow the same law of nature, which is Feynman's formulation of quantum mechanics which is completely equivalent to the de broglie schrodinger formalism of quantum mechanics, which is completely equivalent to Heisenberg formulation of quantum mechanics. And one can actually prove that Feynman's formulation is completely equivalent to the usual form of quantum mechanics that you use um, by solving the Schrodinger equation. Uh, it, it, it one has to get into a little bit of mathematics, but it is not all that complicated. All that you have to use is a bunch of, you know, Gaussian integrals and so on, which um, I'm sure you know how to solve. So I will not get into that algebraic framework, but that can be done. And once you do that, all right, you can demonstrate that this gives you exactly the same answer as you get from the Schrodinger Heisenberg formulation of quantum mechanics. Why should you believe in Feynman 
approach? Because if it works, because it is completely equivalent to Schrodinger Heisenberg formalism. And this is what explains the Zeeman effect. This is what explains the Stark effect. This is what explains atomic spectroscopy. This is what explains nuclear properties, nuclear spectroscopy, condensed matter physics, electronic behavior of matter, dielectrics, insulators, semiconductors, everything. Everything is explained by quantum mechanics. And if you work with these Gaussian integrals, which is not terribly hard to do, you can actually show that the path integral approach of Richard Feynman is completely equivalent to the Schrodinger Heisenberg formulation of quantum mechanics. So classical mechanics corresponds to the dominance of the contribution of the paths for which action is an integral when action, we know how to define it. It is the time integral of the Lagrangian as you have on the screen. This is action. And when this integral is much larger than the Planck's constant. So the Planck's constant becomes the unit of quantum mechanics as we know from our earlier discussions from various textbooks and courses that you have taken earlier. So it is not surprising that Planck's constant shows up over here. So it becomes the unit in which angular momentum is measured. And then this classical action is much larger than the quantum action, the, the quantum, the unit of quantum action, then you have classical mechanics or the Newton's laws or the Lagrange or the uh, Hamilton's laws uh, which work out. So, so we are dealing with Feynman particles. We are not talking about waves. We are not talking about corpuscles. And uh, now we are coming to the close of this discussion. I will be happy to take some questions, but I will just show one or two interesting uh, applications of this particular approach. And uh, as I mentioned, the famous example of quantum mechanics, famous illustration of quantum mechanics is the Young's double slit experiment. Whether you do it with light or electrons or nucleons, or you can do it with fullerene molecules, if you like, with anything, this Feynman approach works. And I consider a particular Young's double slit experiment in which you have a solenoid behind the screen, behind the slit S1 and S2. So this figure that you see in the upper left of the screen is not to scale. So uh, please watch my words. This solenoid is right behind the screen between slit S1 and S2. And these particles could go from either side of the solenoid. And when you pass a steady current through the solenoid, you know that the magnetic field is completely localized inside the solenoid. Okay? It is magnetic field outside the solenoid is zero. That is the reason you call the magnetic field a solenoidal. Okay? And what is interesting is that the magnetic field outside the solenoid is zero. So the particles which go from behind the solenoid and which go from the front of the solenoid, neither of these particles have any way of sensing the magnetic field because the magnetic field is inside the solenoid and not outside. Despite that, if you change the magnetic field, if you change the current, the interference pattern changes and it can shift from this pattern to this pattern, even when the magnetic field is zero. Now, this is a strange phenomenon which is uh, known as the quantum Aronobohm effect, and uh, this can be very easily explained using Feynman's path integrals because what we have to remember is that these particles are picking different phases from the front of the solenoid and from the back of the solenoid. They are traversing different paths and they pick up different phases which are determined by the vector potential which is not zero. The magnetic field is zero. The magnetic field is the curl of the vector potential, all right? 
the potential itself is not zero. It is a field which is zero. And that is the reason uh, it is the potentials which have become more important in physics rather than forces and fields which are really not even used in the Schrodinger equation. It is a potential which goes into the Schrodinger equation. And it is this vector potential which contributes to the phase. And this phase is therefore different for the particles going in front of the solenoid compared to the particles which go from behind the solenoid. And you can control this interference pattern by changing the current in this. So this is um, known as the Berry phase in quantum mechanics. And um, the Aronobohm uh, phase is essentially the Berry phase. And the Feynman formulation of quantum mechanics, because it tells you that the phase is what is going to determine the net you know, interference pattern at the screen as we just this as we just discussed. So this is my last slide, and I want to thank all of you once again, uh, the Indian Association of Physics Teachers, of which uh, you know it's always gives me a very special pride when I participate in the events organized by the Indian Association of Physics Teachers, and this time. Uh, they have collaborated with uh, SN Tech and with Gujarat Council of Science and Technology and great efforts by Harshal Chintan, uh, Professor uh, Tushar Pandya and many others who are over there. So thank you all very much for this wonderful opportunity and I'm, I'll now have uh, time for questions. Yes, thank sir. You. Thank you so much, sir, for this uh, wonderful, informative and uh, journey through Newton's laws, how Newton's laws work. So now I think we will have very brief and very straightforward two, three questions. So, uh, sir, can you just uh, stop sharing the screen? All right. All right. I'll stop share. So am I going to hear the question or am I going to read the question? How is it coming to me? Yes, so we are going to tell the participants to just dictate their questions and you can just answer two to three questions. Okay, so uh, do you want me to escape and uh, from the presentation mode? Or shall I continue with Yes, this? sir, it is done. Well, you're controlling yes, the, so. whatever you want. So you would have an option of stop sharing the screen on the top of the screen. Yeah, I, I have clicked on that. Okay. Yes. Okay, sir. Yeah. Yes, now yes, perfect. Now this is perfect, sir. Okay. So do now, you have a one question from Kapil yes. Dev Prashad? Mm -hmm. Yes. Just a minute, sir. Hello, Kapil Dev, sir. Can you hear us? Yes, sir. Am I audible? Yes, I can see you. Uh, hello, sir. I'm Kapil Dev Prashad from Jharkhand, Nilambar Pitambar University. Yes. Uh, sir, my question is that, uh, as you told about the path, uh, feminine particle path, but, sir, I don't know about the feminine particle. Mm -hmm. Sir. Sir, is it uh, different from other particles? Well, it is whatever traverses from the source to the screen. 
whatever is traversing from the source to the screen is what I call as Feynman particle. You would have described the same thing earlier as an electron particle. If you, your source was an electron gun, you might have called it as a photon. If your source was a, a light source, all right? So it is the same thing. But the object, whatever is traversing, is what I call as a Feynman particle. Okay, sir. Thank you. Yes. Now we have a next question from DG Rathod. Mm -hmm. Hello, can you hear us? Yes. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I certainly can. Uh, yeah. Uh, my simple questions to you is that, you know, what is the best answer? To a equation y l is t minus v and h is t plus v always. Uh, am I? Yeah, I think I, I get your question. L, l is t minus v because when you put l equal to t minus v in action integral, action is the integral of the Lagrangian. And when this Lagrangian is described as T minus V, and then you extremize action, you demand under what condition would action be stationary? What condition would it be an extremum? Either um, a maximum or a minimum, or uh, it can even be a line. Under what condition is it stationary? Then what you get a necessary and sufficient condition. The necessary and sufficient condition under which action becomes an integral when the Lagrangian integrand is described as T minus V is the Lagrangian condition which is completely equivalent to Newton's equation F equal to dP by dP, which is what I showed in one of my earlier slides. So that yeah, I I I I y l should be t minus v, and h is t plus v because for isolated system it represents the total energy. So since you neither create nor destroy energy, energy is conserved. It is the same as it was yesterday, as it is today, and as it will be tomorrow. So the constancy of has to do with invariance with respect to time from past to present to future. So that is a symmetry associated with the constant of energy. And this turns out to be the sum of the kinetic energy and the potential energy. So H must always be T plus V and the Lagrangian must always be T minus V. There is no choice. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, but I always worried, you know. Uh, hello, are you hearing yes. me? Yes, yeah, yes. My, uh, my only concern is that, you know, before we come down to this explanations to the students normally, yes. before that we have already defined L is T minus V without uh -huh. such explanation. Uh -huh. After we do the constraint and everything, Yes. Straight away, we write Lagrangian equation. Yes. And in Lagrangian equation, we write L is T minus V directly. Mm -hmm. Correct. So I think it will be useful to point out that it is this particular expression of the Lagrangian which gives you consistency mechanics which they are already familiar with from their high school physics okay okay so 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 no, no other form of the Lagrangian will allow you to develop or extract an equation of motion so the equation is essentially the Lagrange's equation of motion and let me repeat this point how do you get the Lagrange's equation you get it by extremizing action you yeah. are asking the question, under what condition is action an extremum? Then you recognize the fact 
that the action is an extrema under a certain condition. This condition is a necessary condition. It is also a sufficient condition. The necessary sufficient condition for action to be an extrema is the Lagrange's equation, which is completely equivalent to f equal to dp by dt. So only the use of L equal to T minus V will allow you to get this equation of motion. Nothing else. Yes, sir. We have one more last question from yes. this sir. Mm -hmm. Hello? Hello, sir. Can you yes. hear us? Hello? Uh, okay. good, good morning, sir. Can you? Yes, sir. How are you, sir? Uh, thank I you very much for a nice... I not lecture. only see you, I not only hear you, I <laughs> know you, Chaitan. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm from MS University, Baroda. Yes, yes sir. Sir, I, thank you for a nice lecture. Sir, I was asking, I was wondering how relativity would figure into uh, this path integral approach of uh, Feynman or uh, is there any universal set of laws that one can yeah, think, they, including they the relativistic they, aspects? Yeah, yeah, there certainly is a relativistic formulation, but then you don't, uh, you work with fields and so on. And um, I have not entered that yes, domain in today's discussion. But in right. general, Chaitan, you have to remember that just as we have seen that uh, the Newtonian or the Lagrangian formulation is a very good approximation to quantum mechanics in many situations. And what are those situations? Absolutely. Whenever the classical action is much larger than the quantum unit of action. So whenever that happens, you can use classical mechanics. So non-relativistic formulation, likewise, is a very good approximation to the relativistic formulation because of the fact okay. that the speed of light is huge. Even if it is finite, it is huge. So the same line of thinking goes into the relativistic formulation. But then you work with quantum fields and it becomes mathematically a yes. little more challenging to discuss it. But I will not get into that. But basically, the approximation. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Any other questions? I think now we, I think uh, can now we can take the questions from the feedback uh, form. Sure. Yes. So at the end, uh, now I would like to conclude the session. Uh, Deshmukh sir, we are very much uh, thankful to you for agreeing for this lecture and uh, giving us this very informative lecture starting from 1500 century Galileo to Feynman sir and uh, your contributions contributions in this particular field. So we would like to be very thankful to you on the behalf of IAPT. You are being very and generous sir. Chintan. Thank you. It's an opportunity for me actually. Thank you so much sir. Thank you. So are we done with questions and answers or is there anything for me to consider? Uh, I think, sir, it uh, it's upon you, sir. Well, uh, I have time, and uh, if if we are connected, uh, I can take a few more questions. Okay, sir. Okay, fine, sir. We have one question for from Sarabjit Datta. Mm -hmm. Right, so hello, sir. Am I audible? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, sir. So, sir, you talked about the Young's double slit experiment and mm -hmm. how it uh, encompasses different uh, aspects of quantum mechanics, uh, yes. rightly uh, pointed out by uh, Richard Feynman. Now, sir, yes. if we conduct the Young's double slit experiment with the help of electrons, then yes. we see that there are uh, two kinds of results that we can get. We can also get the interference-like pattern and we can also get the particle-like pattern. For example, mm -hmm. if we shoot electrons through the slits and hypothetically speaking, if you try looking at the electrons yeah. through which slit it passes, yes. then yeah. we get a particle-like pattern. But instead, yes. if you don't do that, and if we yeah. only look at the screen, for instance, yeah. then we get an interference-like pattern. So yes. from a bird's point of view, uh, the observer or the person who is making the, uh, making the measurement is not actually interacting with the electrons per se, but still yeah. uh, the observer, you know, determines the result of the experiment to a large extent. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, 
how is that possible or like uh, well, Sanabji, what is uh, the very Sanabji, this is at the very heart of quantum mechanics i did not go into the details of what is uh, usually called as a which way experiment so this yes, is the which way experiment and uh, which way means you are asking the question did the particle uh, whether a wave a uh, corpuscle or the feynman particle you are asking did it go from slit 1 or from slit 2 okay which is the question you are posing and you can conduct this which way experiments in a variety of different ways you can perform them at a time which is called as a delayed a time which way experiment uh, so you can get get this information at a much later time than you expect the original feynman particle to have reached the screen but the moment there is this I mean, which way the particle would have gone? The interference is lost. The quantum interference is lost. The quantum interference is essentially a consequence of the superposition principle. It is essentially a consequence of quantum entanglement. That the particle has the possibility of going through either slit one or slit two. either dead or alive this can happen the principle of superposition operates and this is when quantum interference if you perform a which way experiment including what is called as a delayed choice which way experiment the interference is lost this is the this this is the complete description of the entanglement process again yes, you are not answering why this happens that is not even our botheration we are asking okay when you perform an experiment in a certain way either a which way experiment or not performing a which way experiment what is the interference pattern that you will see the question is what how do you describe it the question is how and we get the answer either using schrodinger heisenberg or feynman formulation that's quantum mechanics right sir thank you all right yes we have one more question from mithil kumar patel yes meet kumar patel i am sorry hello yes hello meet can you hear us hello we can take the next question from harsh pratap yes hello hello am i audible to you sir yes i am able to hear you harsh i am not able to see you but i can hear you okay okay sir so sir my question is that Uh, are we not interested in calculating the Feynman particle uh, because it is not a question to us mechanics, or can we calculate it? What What is your question? Because th there was a little bit of noise uh, uh, hum in the background, so I did not get the question. Can you repeat it? I want to ask that why we are not interested in calculating the speed of Feynman particle. Arsh, if if you want to be interested, nobody can stop you from being interested. What quantum mechanics tells you that if you know the position, you cannot know the momentum. You because you cannot perform a measurement of position without using a probe. And when you use a probe, you lose information about the momentum. 
the probe has to interact with the target. If it doesn't interact, you get no information. If it interacts, you lose some information. So there are some measurements which are compatible and some measurements which are not compatible. It's not that you cannot measure anything simultaneously. You certainly can measure many things simultaneously. Take the case of an electron in the hydrogen atom, for example. You can determine its energy. You can determine um, it, the component of its angular momentum along some axis. You can measure the angular momentum itself, which is why the operators for these three properties, which is H for energy, L square for the angular momentum, and LZ for the component of the angular momentum. And these three properties, you can measure simultaneously. They are compatible. Measurement of one will not disturb the measurement of the other. You measure the energy, then you measure the angular momentum, you come back and measure the energy, you'll get the same answer because these are compatible measurements. That is the reason the corresponding eigenvalues of these three operators, the eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian is the energy value, the angular momentum gives you the L quantum number, the orbital angular momentum quantum number, and the component along one direction will give you the M quantum number, M for Madras. Okay, so the energy L and M, or energy if you write energy as one over N squared for bound states, then N, L, and M are three quantum numbers. These are good quantum numbers. Why are they good quantum numbers? You call them as good quantum numbers because they are simultaneously measurable. So certain properties are simultaneously measurable as the example I just gave you, and some properties are not simultaneously measured. The two components of angular momentum are not simultaneously measured. That is how you define a quantum angular momentum. So yes, sir. the question is, we, we, we cannot explain why it is not uh, measurable, why we are not interested in measurement of velocity. You're free to be interested in measurement of velocity we are telling you that, okay, it is not possible, my dear friend, measurement of position and measurement of momentum are not compatible with each other. And this is how we describe the laws of physics. Yes, sir. Now I think uh, we can take the last question of this session yes. from Paras Thakur. Mm -hmm. uh, hello, sir. Yes. Uh, uh, sir, my question is that uh, we have a function like a voice cancellation for phonons. So we can uh, do for phon photons also for this type of functions. Yeah, maybe all, all those are additional factors that one can rope in in your formulation. But we are what we have discussed is a very fundamental formulation of the laws of nature. So yes, what is the information that you can extract about a system? I mean, the physicist being interested in the laws of nature is trying to get information about the system. And let us say he gets information about the position. Then he says that, okay, let me see if I can get some more information. Can I get information about its potential energy? The answer is yes. If you have measured the position, you can get information about the potential energy also. But then he says that, okay, I want to know what it's, it's kinetic energy. And then the answer is that, no, you cannot get it. So what is the maximum information that you can get about a system from what kind of measurements? So that is the question that we have discussed over here. And when multiple particles are involved and there are, there is noise and other statistical properties. So those are, over and above this fundamental consideration. Whether it is phonons or the photons, it's basically the same. So we have dealt with a very fundamental question in today's discussion. Yes, sir. 
now uh, i think we end the session over here itself thank you so much sir for being so kind to answer each and every participant's question so we once again thank you sir for being with us and we also thank all the on from behalf of organizers and on behalf of all the participants to you sir for this wonderful and informative lecture all right thank all the participants Thank you very much and uh, goodbye for now chintan harsha yes, professor pandya all the participants thank you all very much goodbye to all of you thank you sir bye sir bye thank sir you. signing off now all right yes sir